Thanks for my knife. I'm, I needed that during the presentation. So. <laughs> Oh, do you want your phone, maybe? Oh, yeah. Um, no. Did you have that water bottle? Oh, it was in the car. <laughs> Sorry. You can unmet, yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'm J.P. Walsh, the director of the Coastal Resources Center in the Graduate School of Oceanography and a professor in the Graduate School of Oceanography. Welcome to our everyone here. Thank you for joining us. And also to all the virtual viewers from around the world. We are pleased and proud to have you join us for the Sustaining Our Shores Honors Colloquium here at the University of Rhode Island. In a moment, Dean Bontempi from the Graduate School of Oceanography will provide welcoming remarks and introduce the speaker. Before getting into the program, I just want to go over a few things. First, I want to thank those attending in person for wearing a mask throughout the duration of the event. Also, please note the fire exits at the back and at the front. Book sales and restrooms are in the foyer where you entered. Also, our next event will be an excellent panel on the future of seafood. And you can see the title there, uh, as well as the panelists. We are really looking forward to this exciting panel, so I really hope you'll be here next week. At this time, I would like to introduce Miss Lindsay Montanari to offer a land acknowledgement and blessing. Lindsay is the education special, special excuse me, supervisor for the Tomaquag Museum. Starting as a high school intern, Lindsay has grown through the Tomaquag Museum's Indigenous Empowerment Program to become the educator supervisor. In that role, Lindsay now trains the next generation. She coordinates programming, develops and hosts the beloved Children Hour, and supports the development of tours and educational resources. Her visual arts have been featured across Rhode Island and neighboring states. Lindsay also writes and sings her own music, performing at many local venues, including the Hard Rock Cafe in Boston. She is also currently writing a book. Lindsay earned a BA in organizational leadership and change from College Unbound and plans to continue her education. If Lindsay looks familiar, you may have seen her face on the Still Here mural located at 32 Custom Street in Providence, Rhode Island. Please welcome Lindsay to the stage. I'm a little short, okay. <laughs> Asque Kwasen, Natasuis Lindsay, English set, Natasuis Wamasukatan, at Naha Higan set, Katapteshwachikat Machi Ninukisak. So, as I'm sure most of you guys know that I said, maybe not the people online, my name is Lindsay in English, my name is Wamasukatan, or Loving Sea in the Narragansett language, and thank you guys so much for having me here today. So, I just wanted to, before I get into it, give a little bit of information. I'm from Tomaquag Museum, which is the only indigenous-run museum in the state of Rhode Island. And so if you guys have questions or you just want to know anything, I really encourage that you check that out, especially as we're going to be moving to the URI campus very soon. You might want to check us out before we move here because it's, it's coming quick. I'm so excited. And what our director loves to say is there's no Rhode Island history without Narragansett history. So I think that that's really important. I was asked to give a land acknowledgement. We stand here today on Narragansett land, but as a Narragansett tribal member myself, I always find it interesting, this concept of a land acknowledgement. Today, a land acknowledgement has become something important. It is important because at one time, all of Rhode Island was Narragansett land. 
All of the United States was indigenous land. Often in these moments, we are asked to acknowledge a specific small location. During these times, people ask about the significance or sacredness of the specific small plots of land. My answer to those questions, land is sacred. Land has and is being stripped from indigenous people. These land acknowledgments are so that we do not forget the indigenous people here in the United States faced genocide, a genocide that was so strong, so powerful, that we have to remind ourselves to remember that this land did not always belong to the United States. I find it funny, this concept of a land acknowledgement, though, because my people did not believe in land ownership. When we speak about this land that was home to the Narragansetts, when we speak about this land that was home to the indigenous people of this continent, we often take it for granted. We can go to sleep without fear of our villages being burned to the ground, that we won't be forcibly stripped from our homes and that our children will not be taken against our will. Yes, here in Rhode Island, indigenous people face that too. Not just those out West, here in Rhode Island. Narragansett people were displaced as far as Wisconsin and Bermuda. Roger Williams claimed he bought our land not with money, but with love. How could he buy land from people who did not believe that land could be bought? I ask us not only to acknowledge, but to remember, we are still here. Against it all, we are still surviving. Remember us. We remember. Although we have been forced to assimilate, we remember the ways of our ancestors. We are Narragansett. We are the people of the corner of the land, people of the point, people of the bay, people between the waters. Our life ways sustained by the waters. Whether through food ways, pleasure, or ceremony, our waterways continue to nourish us. Our water is our life. Yet so often we are denied access to that which sustains us. Wamasukatan, my name, loving sea. I often wonder why we must pay to access our waters owned by the state. Why, for example, at a beach like Narragansett Beach, would we have to pay to access the ocean? Why at a beach that is named after and was taken from my people would the state charge us for access? We have tribal IDs, federal documentation to confirm who we are. Why must we pay for a beach pass? Isn't our oppression and displacement payment enough? This is one of the reasons that we have such high rates of disease and diabetes cutting indigenous people off from access to our traditional foodways and our ways of utilizing the lands. Statistically, indigenous people are the most impoverished in the nation. But at a time, because, sorry, not but, because at a time where white men were having the opportunity to build generational wealth, we were fighting for our rights and fighting for our lives. And we are still fighting for our rights. The lack of access to our waters is just one of the many oppressions we must fight against. Today, I acknowledge that this land is Narragansett land, that Narragansett people are still here, that indigenous people still exist, that indigenous people are still being oppressed. Remember us. Um, and I would just like to do a quick song in honor of my answer. It translates to, your spirits are watching over me. I know that you are in the sky. Kuna <laughs> Ut kisukwat 
Katabatash. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Lindsay, for that reminder as to why we're all here. I appreciate that from a second generation American, especially. So good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Paula Von Tempe. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Oceanography. I'm located on the Narragansett Bay campus. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the University of Rhode Island for the Sustaining Our Shores Honors Colloquium. Now, the colloquium focuses on things that you've heard before. Our shores and our seas, because we live in the ocean state, and we face significant challenges associated with climate change, socioeconomic disparities, and marine resource limitations. Now, I'd be remiss not to go off script and remind you that we're in the middle of COP26 right now, where we're actually in negotiations as countries for the future of our world facing climate change. In 2019, the IPCC Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere pointed to the unbelievable disparities in climate change impacts on indigenous people and those from historically marginalized and underrepresented groups. So my hope is that the lecture you're about to hear about food, sustainable seafood, actually talks to some of this. This is a, with a growing population on this earth. This is a growing problem for all of those who not only depend on seafood for sustenance, but for economic return. The United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development has just begun. With URI's great expertise in coastal and ocean science and management, we have a responsibility to educate and help address issues and to continue to advance our understanding of the marine realm. A committee of faculty and staff has planned the Sustaining Our Shores Honors Colloquium to educate and encourage discussion and collaboration, and I think it's done just that. Thank you to the committee and the honors program for arranging this evening and the entire program this semester. The future of seafood is a global concern. The fate of fish and other organisms is inherently linked to marine ecosystems and human activities and impacts. The Graduate School of Oceanography and our partners across URI and the world are using state-of-the-art science and innovative research and technologies to explore, understand, and help guide management with our oceans. Earlier this evening, honor students, other guests, and I enjoyed a fabulous adventure in seafood tasting dinner at the Matunic Oyster Bar. So thank you to the Matunic Oyster Bar, all the staff, and Perry Rosso for hosting us. This dinner showcased how we need to be creative and curious with seafood to achieve sustainability. Now I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker, Barton Siever, who's with us tonight. Barton Siever is one of the world's leading sustainable seafood experts and educators. Before leaving the restaurant industry to pursue his interests in sustainable food systems, he was an award-winning chef leading top seafood restaurants in Washington, D.C. After traveling the world with the National Geographic Society, he translated his experience into his leadership in the area of sustainable seafood innovations. Barton has delivered lectures, seminars, and demos to a multitude of audiences. He has written seven seafood-centric books, including American Seafood and The Joy of Seafood, and has contributed to many outlets, including Coastal Living, Rachel Ray, Fortune, The New York Times, O oh, The Oprah Magazine, and Savor. He has appeared on 60 Minutes, CNN, and The TED Stage. He's also the founder of Coastal Culinary Academy, a multi-platform initiative that seeks to increase seafood consumption, through seafood-specific culinary educations at all levels of cooks. He's the National Geographic Explorer and was the Director of Health and Sustainable Food Programs at Harvard School of Public Health. Let's please give Barton Siever a warm welcome to the University of Rhode Island. Welcome. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm really thankful that you are here too. Uh, 
First off, uh, Wanasukatan, or Lindsay, uh, thank you. I, I believe that she's gone, but um, what a, an incredibly powerful way to start off. Uh, something that, and well, it just drives home what I think the value of what I hope to, to speak to about tonight, which is the future of seafood. Uh, and I'm gonna make the case that the future of seafood is uh, the future of ourselves, and that uh, seafood itself is a measure of dignity for us all and for our communities. And that was the message that I took first and foremost from what Wanasukatan uh, shared with us was dignity, dignity from place, dignity from food, dignity from access, dignity from recognition, dignity from being seen and heard and appreciated. And uh, yeah, so as much as Wanasukatan I see and appreciate and hear you, I also want to say that to each and every one of you. I appreciate you. Ultimately, I get to spend my days in the quest for food. And to me, that's so valuable because food is love. Food is an act of kindness. Feeding another person is an act of generosity, and the world needs far more of that. And anyone involved in food, or anyone involved in the processes of food, or anyone involved in sustaining that which gives us food, our oceans and our lands, they themselves, you, are deeply engaged in the act of love, of giving love and kindness to other people. So, thank you. I appreciate all of you for what you do and for your passions and whatever it is that have led you here to me tonight. I think we're gonna have some fun, at least. I hope we are. And I'm gonna talk about some fun things. Um, first off, I think you should definitely come to this one next, by the way. Uh, Monica Jane is utterly amazing and fascinating and just amazing in her understanding and, and capacity and pursuit of, of the future of seafood that is a, a person that I would put the future of seafood in good hands. I would say in good hands if in hers. As well as Sarah Schumann, one of your local heroes in the audience with us tonight. And uh, someone that, who's my history with has gone back, I think, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, when we used to sing in a church choir together back down into Washington, D.C. Anyway, a fisherwoman in Alaska here and founder of Eating with the Ecosystem. Uh, truly a local hero to those of us even beyond the locality. So please, Come back next week and see both of those truly amazing people. Um, how do we do this slide thing? Oh, there we go. Hey. So I get to talk to you tonight about the future of seafood, right? It's a modest topic. Um, hey, why not? Sounds fun, right? So I wrote a book about the history of seafood, and the purpose of that book was to sort of orient myself towards the future of it. And... Um, well, if I may, to start off with telling you a little bit of a story about how I came to be in front of you here tonight. And that is, uh, I was born and raised in a very multi-ethnic neighborhood in Washington, D.C. called Mount Pleasant. It was mostly Eritrean, Ethiopian, Guatemalan, and El Salvadorian, and black populations there. But especially the Eritrean, the Ethiopian, and the Salvadorian populations. They had been fleeing civil unrest in their countries. The Sandinista conflict and the communist uprising. And, well... These were people that had fled for their lives to a new country and brought with them their dignity and their traditions. And never are dignity and traditions on greater display than when we feed another person. And this was the crucible of food in which I was raised. Families new to the country, but old and deep and beautiful and loving in the food that they served and the ingredients they served as well. This was just such, I mean, just a, such a heady environment for a young man to, to just experience the world, right? Not only through the cultures that these people brought to the table and which they shared with us, but also literally through the ingredients from every corner of the globe which imported onto our plates. I mean, as a young child, I remember walking through the spice aisles of the Eritrean markets and little uh, El Salvadorian bodegas and just seeing goat meat and crambola and, and teff flour and all these incredible spices and all these things that were completely foreign to my experience, which was otherwise shopping at Safeway or Stop and Shop but for the bodegas, which we, which we also frequented. And so food, to me, was this means to explore the world. Not only the people who lived in it and expressed themselves through food, but also literally to explore the physical world by that which we take intimately into our bodies through the act of eating. I also had, uh, this was 1980s in Washington, D.C., which was not a great town at that time, Marion Barry era, the crack epidemic, murder capital of the world, um, it was, it was an interesting place to grow up, let me tell you. But um, I also had the, I had the incredible fortune, as so many others did not, to get out of D.C. during the summers when the violence was really bad. And I had, 
well, there was a pig farm down on the Patuxent River, a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay, and we got to go spend some time basically as, as <laughs> paid laborers there. And um, that's where I really began to understand the world through my quest for food. And uh, there's a great John Hersey quote, a wonderful author, the old Yale professor, author of Hiroshima, as well as uh, Blues, the book about fishing, which I think is one of the greatest tracts ever written about our relationship with food. And in, it, he said, in one quote, he says, in our quest for food, we begin to find our place in the systems of this world, which is very, very true. And I also had a copy, not only of Blues, but of Yule Gibbons. And those of you who remember that old kook, he was, uh, wow, he, he, was, he was a funny, funny man, right? Those old grape, grape nuts commercials. Um, but uh, yeah, I spent my summers wandering around wondering, huh, what does that taste like? And with the sort of the deep appreciation of culture and community and of ingredients, it was, no, it was no surprise that I became a chef after high school when I needed some place to put my energies and attentions and uh, college was certainly not for me, and well, there I set off into the world. And I had this, just an incredible opportunity to live and work and study all over the world. I worked as a sardine fisherman, an octopus fisherman in Africa off the coast of Esuera in Morocco. I had the opportunity to then come back into the United States to run restaurants for the inimitable Jose Andres. Uh, those of you who maybe have heard of him, he's the first chef to be up for a Nobel Peace Prize for his work with World Central Kitchen. And it was under his tutelage uh, and his and a gentleman named Robert Egger who founded DC Central Kitchen. These gentlemen were the first to teach me that a chef is more than the sum of ingredients that we put on our plates. That we are in fact one cog in this giant human machine that ends up in the result of either good or bad human experience. And seeing the power of food firsthand through my experiences there. So, I had opportunity very early on, I was 24 years old when I was first asked to step out onto my own as a chef, to write my own menu, to translate my experiences about food onto the page, into the experience that you would have coming into my restaurants. And that's quite a very personal document. Uh, I mean, a menu, I mean, Perry, what you all serve tonight, hey, it reads well, it was delicious. It is also an astounding treatise on all that your chefs have learned and all that they believe and all that you have created around them and all of the people and the men and women and others, that opportunity through you which flows to us, the consumers. Right? A menu is a, it's a damn important document. And you can learn a lot through a menu. And so I was like, what do I want, what do I want to communicate through my menu? And I ever more grew interested in sustainability. Uh, sure, we had a, an opportunity and responsibilities and chefs to sustain those who walk through our front doors to serve safe food, but more recently to serve nutritious food, and even more recently to serve food that has a narrative around it, something that connects us and nourishes us through community. Right? I mean, that is what we look to restaurants to do more so and more so. And that idea of sustainability began sort of wandering around my head. And I began to focus not just on the front door and my responsibility there, but my back door and my responsibility I had to the men and women that were showing up that sustained me. I mean, no farms, no food, no fishermen, no seafood. Without them, what am I doing? I'm just standing near a fire. That's it. So I began to really take seriously the opportunities that I had as a chef. And at this time, I, we were hearing these you know, tragedies about Orange Ruffy, decimated, gone. Chilean sea bass disappeared, where? Into our mouths, it was gone. Orange ravi bluefin tuna, I mean, these were the stories that were, that were of the day. Swordfish, give a swordfish a break campaign was the first real advocacy thing that I did as a chef. And this was the crucible in which I was being sort of brought up. But I found a problem with that narrative. And that narrative was typical as to how environmentalism often goes, which is bad human bad. By your actions, you have destroyed and you have made sick. Through the choices that we make for dinner, we have destroyed the planet and we have made ourselves sick. And I looked at that and I ended up taking great hope from that. Because the other side of that coin is that by the choices we make for dinner, we can heal and we can restore. The very positive narrative of the chef and the role that consumers have to drive change and to live in a world that we want to see, right? So I began to just... Well, follow that path. And I kept following it until it led me out of restaurants, which was a very fortunate thing. I now consider myself a recovering chef. 
Uh, I had seven restaurants in the DC area, and that, that, that was enough. That was enough. And I also had opportunity to step out as a National Geographic Explorer, which is as sexy of a job as you can imagine it being. And this came about because National Geographic was doing a lot of their entertaining in our restaurants because we had this environmental bend. And so it was wonderful. And I got to meet the most incredible people. I mean, not only just the big donors and people like Quincy Jones, who was just the coolest human being ever, uh, people that would come in, but I got to meet one of your own, Bob Ballard. I got to meet Barry Costa Pierce. I got to meet Sylvia Earle and the Cousteau family. I mean, just everybody was there. Celine and uh, just... Oh, I mean, it was amazing. It was this wonderful thing that was happening. And National Geographic was launching this Oceans Initiative at the time, which has gone very, very well. And Enrique Sala was there, just speaking eloquently about everything about ichthyology and climate and clouds and canyons and currents and everything about the oceans that makes them them. But we were not discussing seafood and people, which was a very important way that we interact with our oceans, right? And so I had an opportunity to ask President John Fahey at the time. I said, hey, you're like, would there, you know, could we do something like that? He said, yeah, great. How do you do it? And I was like, okay. That's really cool. So I did. And I went out into the world as an explorer. But still kind of wearing this, this hat of like, hey, our purpose here is to reduce our impact on marine ecosystems. Very much this sort of bad human, bad sort of mentality. And a lot of it, honestly, was inflected with the, uh, the white male upbringing, which is like, uh, let me tell you how things should be. And I got out into the world, and I very quickly realized that that ain't no solution. That's just not what's going to happen. It's not so much about sustainability as reducing our impact on e ecosystems as much as it is integrating communities into the process and working to maximize the impact that ocean ecosystems have on people. And I came to understand that, in my opinion, the end result of sustainability is the endurance of thriving humans. Our success, our ability to thrive in our places, as Wanasukata was talking about tonight, that, to me, is what sustainability is all about. And where I live now on the jagged, ragged, delicious coast of Maine, sustainability is the ability for a daughter to follow in 11 generations of bootsteps. As I said earlier to the class, to take helm of that lobster boat, to choose to raise and to start a family in her place, doing her things, celebrating her culture, expressing her self. That is sustainability. Don't, I mean, yes, we can talk about catch rates and biological mass and all these other things that are in the ocean that are incredibly important and that must drive our decisions. But ultimately, it is her ability to endure that becomes the compelling narrative of sustainability and to me becomes the narrative of the future of seafood. The future of seafood is as a tool, not for, no, the future of seafood is not for us as people to fix seafood, but rather for us to use seafood to fix people now. And I've come to understand that my mission in life is to get more people across all demographics to eat more seafood. And this is a pretty large sort of step away from what I set out to do, right? Which is reduce our impact on ecosystems. But my arguments that I'll make for why we should be eating more seafood are this. From an environmental standpoint, we need to look at seafood not as just this single ingredient category, but rather as part of our diet and the role that it plays. And when we do such, where does seafood land? Well, it's in the middle of our plate. It's the center of the plate protein. That's what it is here in America, right? And I'll just talk about the American experience, though I understand it's far more diverse. But this is what's relevant to us, and I think the science here. In the center of the plate, when measured against land animal protein, seafood simply has a fin up in the sustainability game. Across five very important metrics, land use alterations, how much land has to be plowed under in order to raise that seafood versus land animal protein, greenhouse gas emissions, freshwater usage, feed conversion ratio, and antibiotic use. Across all five of those very important metrics, seafood at its worst comes in on par with land animal proteins at about their best. Now, I am not la anti land animal protein. In fact, I believe them to be fundamentally necessary to sustainable agriculture. We have to have them, but as integrated species, not in the way that we raise them now. And so when we look at our choices for animal protein, 
Seafood is the best of those choices. Eating small, manageable, delightful, enjoyable portions of protein, yes, in a mostly plant-based diet, but seafood is the better environmental choice. Of course, within the seafood category, there is a lot of room to cover. And yes, there is some very, very bad seafood that has ties to some of the very worst crimes humanity has ever committed, with slavery and other things. I mean, I'm not saying free pass for seafood. But I'm saying categorically, when we look at the fact that we eat over 250 pounds of pork beef, lamb, pork, beef, lamb, veal, turkey, and chicken every year in this country, and we eat 18 pounds of seafood per person per year, that equation, on an environmental standpoint, just doesn't add up. Vegetables first, then some seafood, and then small adequate portions of meat. In addition to this, from an economic model, seafood is just incredibly important. One in 11 people on this planet are wholly dependent upon seafood for their livelihoods. Though seafood represents 2% of the global food supply, it represents 9% of the livelihoods. Its impact is way outsized. And if you begin to look at the economic impact, especially of aquaculture, you begin to see that it's actually a mechanism that I believe to actually improve a lot of those economic outcomes. 73% of people that are engaged in aquaculture globally are women. Most of those are in developing nations. Now, I'm not saying that all of those jobs are good or that there isn't a lot to do there to improve that, but if there is a direct mechanism through which we can invest in women's empowerment and job and economic development, hmm. That sounds like a really delicious thing to, to think about. Now, in addition to the, just the economic opportunity of, uh, of wild capture fisheries maintaining those, um, economic opportunity for aquaculture is, is amazing. A colleague of mine, a dear, uh, friend, uh, Dr. Haley Froelich out of the UC system, she did a paper recently uh, in which she said that in ocean hotspots, so areas of the ocean that are particularly well suited towards aquaculture. So California's Central Valley is an agricultural hotspot. Iowa is an agricultural hotspot. The Gulf of Maine is an aquaculture hotspot. Why? Because the water temperature is right, the water flow is right, the tides and the currents, all of this, the food availability, everything there is right. And there are ocean hotspots all over the world. And in her paper, she said that if we were to intensively and sustainably farm, which we know how to do, an area of the ocean the size of Lake Michigan, we could produce equal to the current total wild capture production, 90 million metric tons, pounds. 90 million metric tons, excuse me. That's in an area the size of, the area of the ocean the size of Lake Michigan. Now, Lake Michigan, as it relates to the ocean, is one one-thousandth of a percent, okay? Now, granted, there's a lot of ocean that's six feet down that Bob Ballard is busy figuring out, and you know, aquaculture's probably not gonna go there, and Bob, you're incredible, you're amazing. But there is an awful lot of economic opportunity there. And when we look at a product that, from an environmental perspective, is a, just a better equation in terms of efficiency, and then we look at the economic opportunity, we begin to look at the new blue economy as something that's very attractive. And the third argument that I would make for why more seafood is simply for our health, the acute nutritive benefits of it. I mean, and the American diet is killing us. Eight out of top ten causes of death and uh, eight out of top ten causes of death and disease in America are diet and food related. Top one: uh, heart disease, cardiac failure. And we look at a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acids and a, an attendant reduction in red meat at the same time. You can reduce cardiac mortality incidences by 36 percent. Extrapolate that out. That's 55,000 American mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles, grandparents that would be saved every year. If you look at overall reduction in mortality incidences, 17%. And if you look at the increase in the quality of life due to neurocognitive, neurocognitive developmental benefits in young children, pregnant and nursing mothers, as well as to the cognitive uh, retention of cognitive uh, abilities, later in life if you look at depression, diabetes, anxiety, uh, you begin to look at seafood as not a cure-all, but in my opinion, I begin to see it as a moral issue, that we get more people across all demographics eating more seafood because the environment, because of the economy, and because it will literally save tens of thousands of lives and improve the quality of life for millions. It's just what it does. And by the way, it's delicious. So if there's nothing else that you remember from my talk tonight, 
How about this? So my colleague, Dr. Darius Mosafarian from Tufts, uh, he says the three S's of public health. Don't smoke, wear your seatbelt, and eat seafood. Cool? Okay. So that's why I want to get people eating more seafood. So let's talk about what we eat. Well, I talked about this uh, already, sort of the, uh, the, the proportion. Um, this is the, the feed conversion ratio. Uh, so just looking at that, those efficiencies going back here to sort of the environmental case. So salmon farming, which is this over here, 1.1 pounds of feed going in to one pound of feed coming out. Now feed conversion ratio isn't seen uh, in the same light anymore. It's not just a straight efficiency as we, as we once thought it was. But bottom line is you get more efficient the, the bigger and more mammal you get. I mean, you and me and pigs and chickens and cows, we're all busy fighting atmospheric pressure and keeping our blood and blood warm, and we grow big bones just to live in the environment we do. Fish? <laughs> no, nah, dude, I float. That's cool. I'm cold-blooded. I float. It's just simply a more efficient system. All right, so let's look at what we eat and which seafoods we eat. And I'm going to start off with wild capture, and then I'm going to go into aquaculture, and then I want to talk about sort of social and civic license, social license and, and the virtues of seafood economies. So up here, you've got wild capture fish, the red and the orange there, the red equaling the uh, freshwater capture and orange being the wild capture. Now within that category, you can see that it's remained pretty much stable for the last 30, 40 years or so at around 90 million metric pounds. There's a lot of work we need to do in here. World Bank rec recommends that uh, we reduce fishing effort by about 5% over the next 10 years, each year over the next 10 years. Uh, Ray Hilborn out of the University of Washington and UNFAO numbers suggest that about 70% of the seafood that's captured is uh, coming from sustainable fisheries, the other 30% being uh, unsustainable or overfished at the time. Uh, and then furthermore, about 85%, I, I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but of the seafood that we eat from wild capture is coming from sustainable fisheries. Now, oftentimes you might hear that 90% of the oceans are overfished. They're depleted. They're gone. Unsustainable, right? So that's a UNFAO number. And if you break that down, so from the 100%, about 60% are fished to their sustainable maximum, or fished sustainably. About 30% are overfished, depleted, or just gone. And about 10% are underfished. And what we often hear is the 60% fully fished, which used to be called fully exploited, which sounded pretty bad, but it just been fished to its sustainable limit. And that 30% that's overfished, and you lump those together and you get 90%, which makes a really great headline. But if you take the fully and sustainably fished and the 10% that are underfished and lump those together, you get 70% are sustainably fished, which is a very different headline than what we've read. And this is not me threading a needle on grammar here. And these are just the optimism or pessimism with which we read those numbers, I think. And where are you starting from? So let's look at what we are eating in that wild capture. So IUU equals illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries. This is the really, really bad stuff. This is where human rights abuses happen. This is where piracy happens. This is no good. And we should be doing absolutely everything we can to avoid this. And the way to do that is to know the source of your seafood. That's it. Just That's, that's the thing to know. Yes, that can get a little complicated at times, but bottom line is if you ask where your seafood is from, you are fighting against that actively. Discards means Things we catch, but we throw overboard dead dying. Peruvian anchoveta used to be the world's largest single species fishery, uh, which has been replaced by Alaska pollock now. But Peruvian anchoveta, and that one's up there because it's important because it's a reduction fishery. It's a massive amount of fish that we catch that never goes to feed a human. It goes into just about everything else, including pigs, chickens, cows, linoleum, tiles, moisturizers, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, cosmeceuticals, and other things. So now let's look at the rest of those categories pelagic ground fish and invertebrates, that's what we eat, right? All right, so let's think about those categories. In the US, this is what we consume. 95% of our total seafood consumption comes from 10 species categories. If you look at that, 65% of it is coming from shrimp, tuna, and salmon alone. 
I get really bored of shrimp tuna and salmon. They're really delicious. But you know what, man? There's so much more in the ocean. And thank you, Sarah, for all of your work with Eating with the Ecosystem uh, and that she's doing to really elucidate and bring to life the things that I'm about to talk about. Now, when you drag a net through the ocean, do you think it looks 10 species? No, it looks a lot more like this. And I, I just love this painting. This is an old Passarotti painting. Um, fish markets should not look like this, okay? I mean, there's like a merman and like some seals and some extinct sturgeon and stuff in there. Like, no, don't eat that. What I'm trying to represent here is that that's what the ocean looks like. It's a diverse ecosystem, right? And what do we do? Doom, 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 doom. We narrow it down to 10 categories. But I'm going to go back on that. We actually narrow it down basically to six categories, which is shrimp, salmon, canned tuna, flaky white fish, 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 crab and clams. And clams, I mean, really, you're eating potatoes and cream because that's all clam chowder, folks. So it's not really even a seafood category. I mean, it's just like saying, like, ketchup is a vegetable. It's like, I don't know, like clams are sort of seafood, but really you're eating the cream. Really, you've got only six categories in, in there, and five of those in the top ten are all basically the same fish. And in an ocean that looks like this, we place an economy that looks like this. This is irrational. This is demand-based. The ocean is supply-based, and sustainability must be a supply-based uh, economy. And so what this looks like when it comes down to the economies of this is, this is a picture from a great friend of mine, Dr. Uh, uh, Brian Scarry, another National Geographic photographer, uh, just an incredible human being. Uh, and thank you to him for allowing me to use this. So this is a uh, Campeche Bank shrimp fishery down in Mexico. And you can see there you got five shrimp. And then you got all these other things. You got puffer fish, guitar fish, you got some croakers in there, you got some like porgies in there, like scup-like fish. You got a bunch of other things, right? Come on over to my house or come to my restaurant, or better yet, just take a shorter drive down to Perry's restaurant down in the Mountain Oak Oyster Bar and find out that these are the most delicious fish you'll ever have. Right? Anybody at dinner tonight think they're willing, more willing to try delicious things just because their minds were blown by what was put in front of them? Yeah, well, unfortunately, you'll never get the experience of trying them because this is the economy of those fisheries. It costs the fishermen money to ice those fish, to bleed those fish, to dress those fish, to pack those fish, to unload those fish, to then pay to push them on the auction floor where they are worth absolutely no money. Why? Because you and me are not willing to buy them. That is our demand. That is our irrational economy that we have placed on the ocean necessitating this. And if you go back to that, category, that chart that I showed you of all of the, you know, which species we catch, the illegal, the discards, etc. This is a really big category, folks. And if we want to start talking about sustainable seafood, well, the least sustainable seafood there is is the one that gets caught and never feeds a person. So taking all of those reduction fisheries, all of those anchovies that feed a pig, and putting them into a delicious can that my son, my five-year-old, thinks is just the very greatest thing on the planet, that's a better use, folks. Now, Menhaden, i got to say, I don't have a recipe for Menhaden. I'm still working on it. But the bottom line is, reduction fisheries should more and more be driven towards human consumption, or they should be left in the ocean, where the economy is natural. And for discards, we should be eating everything that we catch from the ocean. This is just... I mean, that's just solid economics, right? You're not going to feed the world by throwing food away. You're not going to save the oceans by killing them and throwing the food away. All right, so that is the food that we eat from wild capture and just my, uh, my take on diversifying and, again, eating with the ecosystem. And I might ask Sarah later on to, to just say a few words, if you wouldn't mind, about the mission there. Um, so diversify. I mean, diversity is the cornerstone. It is the foundation without which sustainability cannot exist. Whether you're talking about your stock portfolio, whether you're talking about a biological system, an economic system, a cultural system, things in a vacuum don't last long. So aquaculture. Let's go up to what we farm here. Now, I started off with, uh, well, I started off with a very negative attitude towards farm seafood. I was a flag-waving, farmed and dangerous chef. I had the bumper stickers. I put them on the front door of our restaurants, and we issued all farm salmon. I even testified in front of Congress as to why farm salmon should never get an organic standard applied to it. 
And you know what? Then I had a couple experiences that shook my belief in that a little bit because it made me see the larger economy and the larger ecosystem in which aquaculture existed and mattered. And there, the sort of the big aha moment for me happened in the great ocean capital of Switzerland. Um, up here in this Ricola ad uh, called Interlaken, all the way up there in the Swiss Alps, where literally there are people who are like, Ricola. And it's just not where you would expect to find this greenhouse. Now, I've told this story many times before. Some of you may have heard this, but there was a, uh, a tunnel being bored through one of these giant mountains to create a tunnel for intercanton trade, just create economic development opportunity. And while they were doing this, they tapped into a geothermally heated spring. The environmental impact study said they can't just put this 55 degree water out there into the ecosystem without killing everything else in the streams. And there's this guy who's like, huh, I got some hot water. And 55 is hot up here. Yeah, I got some hot water, huh. I'm gonna grow bananas. I'm gonna grow bananas, because it's Switzerland, right? Why not? So he started growing bananas in this greenhouse. And he extracted the heat from the energy and like, I mean, just this glorious thing. And he now produces about 20% of the banana consumption of Switzerland from Interlaken, like way, way up there. And, uh, but then he's like, you know, I still have a little bit of water left and I still got to get its ambient temperature down. So I'm just going to put in these tanks outside. And you know what? I'm going to fill those tanks with Siberian sturgeon and I'm going to harvest them for caviar and smoked meat production. And then when I'm done, I'm going to UV filter the water and then pass it into the ecosystem with no foul. Huh, okay. So now all of a sudden, he's got caviar production and smoked meat production, and he's got banana production. What do you do with that? Do not put them on the same plate. <laughs> do not. But you can open a restaurant like he has, one of two. You can employ about 250 people or so. You can have about 250,000 German tourists flock through that tunnel every year to see the banana man and see what all is happening here. Huh, ingenuity, taking hot water and turning it into food. Wow. I mean, there's more to it than that, yes, but maybe my assumption that just four pounds of anchovies going in to feed one pound of salmon maybe wasn't the full equation there. Hmm. Yeah. And there was another place called Blue Ridge Aquaculture up in the up in the Appalachians up in West Virginia. And I was on the fence about serving this product. And their feed conversion ratio was a little high. It was about two two pounds to one pound, two pounds in to one pound out. And I, that was too high for me until I realized that they had created 65 jobs in an area where the unemployment rate was about 30%, the poverty rate was about 40%. So you're telling me that you're taking two pounds of anchovies and creating all those jobs and economic opportunity. Huh. Maybe the equation is a little more complicated than we originally thought. And that's what got me thinking more and more about aquaculture as a system. And when you begin to look at aquaculture as a system, I, I just get really excited. I mean, the last time we got to invent a food system was 10,000 years ago when we planted the seeds of modern civilization through agriculture. And we are now literally witnessing the birth of an industry, an industry that has the power and capacity to completely revolutionize our experience on this planet and our economic opportunities in communities just such as this, and especially through universities just such as this. You are the driver of this. Fisheries and wild, uh, wild fisheries and aquaculture must coexist. They must. And I'm not here to tell you how they should. That's up to you. Aquaculture is a food system. And therefore, it deserves and must be decided upon by the people within that food system. What does aquaculture look like to you is what matters. This is the kind of access that Wanasukatan was talking about. This is what the dignity of aquaculture and of fisheries looks like. What do your coastlines look like for your children? And when we begin to see that fisheries are this incredibly dynamic opportunity to create jobs, to expand our presence into this new ecosystem, the new blue economy, then we begin to see that the power of food systems is in our hands. And when we begin to see that the product of those food systems 
that Sarah and her fishers are producing, that Perry and his oyster farms are producing, that the chefs and their periwinkle adventures are making possible for us lead to healthy, thriving people too, and a healthier environment, and people that all together have a deep connection to place through food. Seafood begins to look like a tool that we can use to fix people, to make them better, to help them endure. But what's the key to that? It's social license. It's for us as a community to aspire to seafood. We eat 250 pounds of beef, pork, chicken, lamb, veal, and turkey in this country every year. We eat 16, 18 pounds of seafood. Our own government, rock doctors recommend we eat 24 plus. We're just not there. And I account for so much of that bell curve right there. But the bottom line is, we need to move our sights onto the ocean. We need to see ourselves there. If I ask you to close your eyes and picture the small American family farm, what you go on a Saturday morning to visit at the farmer's market, right? You see the undulating hills bathed in autumn splendor setting sun with trees in the distance beautifully colored in autumn's light. You see that perfectly patterned corn leading the eye off into the American horizon, the white house, picket fence, red barn color fading. This is literally the thread by which the fabric of America has been woven. We understand it. We see ourselves as part of that fabric, right? Even if we live in a city and never been to a farm, we still get it. But if I ask you to close your eyes and picture a fishery or a water farm, most people, they might close and see themselves standing on a dock and, and they're gazing wistfully out at a wine dark sea and thinking as though a fishery or a farm is something that happens beyond the horizon of our attentions, executed by someone else, someplace other. But no, a fishery just like that farm is visible to us if we learn to turn around as I can do in my home port in Maine. And a fishery, yes, is these boats. And a fishery, yes, may happen beyond the horizon. But a fishery is actually the sum of the labors and aspirations of a community. It's the desire for a daughter to follow in 11 generations of bootsteps. It's the quality of education her children can then get. It's the opportunity that they have to grow up in a community of peers who each themselves are thriving. A fishery, a water farm, is us. It is the American ideal. And when we begin to see this as patriotism, as community-oriented food, as our opportunity to act together, to eat deliciously, to put our values on display on that plate. And for us personally as individuals to thrive through our own diets, I begin to see seafood as a moral issue. And I begin to see University of Rhode Island and all of you and these coastlines and their deep history, rich heritage and incredible future as the next great chapter. I mean, that's what is so exciting about this. The future of seafood is, in fact, the future of our place. Our place as a human species on this planet, in a, in a planet that we want to live on, that is still gentle to us, allows us to live in our places. Seafood can help us accomplish that. People who are thriving and healthy, seafood can help us accomplish that. Men and women and people that have jobs and opportunities. And seafood can help us accomplish that. Now, I'm not Pollyannish about this. Seafood itself is not the only tool. Oh, woe is us. There are so many things we need to solve. But a delicious dinner gathered together around food that nourishes all that we care most deeply about is a really damn good place to start. So bon appetit, and thank you. That was fun. Do you all like seafood? You do? Yeah, so, so. We talked. You like fish, right, Haley? 
all about the fish. So we have time for a few questions. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So if I go to the market and buy some fish and I look at the case and it says, oh, farm-raised salmon here and wild-caught over here, some voice in the back of my mind, I don't know where it came from, it says, don't buy the farm stuff. And wh why is that? Does it sound like this? Don't buy the farm stuff with that same tone and tenor because it was probably my voice because I said that for a long time. Um, the bottom line is farm salmon uh, for a long time was a product that uh, should have been held up to, to uh, its own circumstances and, and to account. Uh, there were a lot of abuses made in the early days of that industry. But if I could tell you that the first salmon net pen, the, I mean, though aquaculture is thousands of years old and practiced by many cultures, as a global commodity, as a food production uh, economy, it started in 1968 when the first net salmon net pens went into the waters up in Norway, uh, 1970 in Puget Sound, 1971 in Maine. And those were salmon farms. That is a very new industry. And if you think about cars were unsafe at any speed back then, and a computer the size of a Pentagon can't do what our iPhone does just by sitting on it. Um, industries have changed, and a lot of the issues that I held the salmon industry to account for, a lot of those have been solved, to the point now where 50% of global production of farmed salmon is certified as sustainable either by best aquaculture practices or by the uh, Aquaculture Stewardship Council. And almost all of the rest of it is following suit because simply there is no, there is less and less market for the cheap commodity, very poorly produced product. There's still a long way to go, and it's an industry that must ever improve. But bottom line is, a lot of those issues that they faced were also issues to their own good business models. Escapes. No one wants, no one wants their cows to run away, no one wants their salmon to swim away. We, we're figuring that out. Over-reliance on food and antibiotics and sick fish, that's all cost. Um, all these things have been addressed as means of business, not necessarily just because of the, the cudgel of, of environmental sustainability is beaten over them. So I have a lot of faith in the aquaculture industry itself. I also have a lot of concern over it. And the farm salmon industry is now being driven by venture capital money. And behind that is DuPont, Monsanto, ConAgra, uh, and Archer Daniels Midland money. Why? Because they have a lot of soybeans that they want to sell somewhere. The recent aquaculture bill that just got reintroduced to the floor for the third time, right now I was asked by Senator Thune and Senator Blunt, Missouri and Dakota, to come and testify on behalf of this bill. Why? Because they want to sell soy. That scares me. A lot. But the bottom line is we also have to have the bill in order to literally put the regulations in place for this industry to be born. Um, and so we are at a crucible now where we have the opportunity to decide what we want aquaculture to look like. And that's why I mentioned that it's so important that we as a community come ar together around the ideas of what aquaculture is. And that we then learn what it can do and where its pitfalls are. And we decide how aquaculture fits in this community. Maybe that means it's not farmed salmon out there, but maybe it does mean that farmed salmon has some space in a dilapidated mall property in a recirculating aquaculture system, which the property is pretty much perfectly built for salmon farming and has a large flat roof for solar and already has a lot of fresh water rolling through it. Hmm. Food justice, food access, equity, there's a lot of things that begin to get tied up in this. Um, and that's why I have a lot of hope for this, but it has to be done right. Farm salmon also used to just not be tasty. Just, it was too fatty, it was too salmon-y, it, it just hadn't gotten it right. But you know what, man, a lot of wines from California weren't that good for a long time. Now they're, 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 they're mm, yum. Like, you know, industries take a little while to advance. I'm not giving it a free pass, but I do think that we should acknowledge that it is in, in evolution and offer it our the opportunity to create a second opinion. Thanks. It's a, it's, a, it's a big topic. <laughs> hey there, how are you? Hey, well, thank you. Hey, uh, do you see any innovation on, on a significant scale of uh, creating a market for the bycatch? Mm -hmm. Sarah, would now be a good time for you to give a minute or two? 
any innovations on, our, and you can say no and just say, come back next week. Okay. Um, so groups like Eating with the Ecosystem, uh, my own restaurants, uh, you know, so in my restaurants, we, we had over, we served over 150 species in the first year and a half or so that we were open. Um, and I, it's because I had a relationship with fishers uh, and I had just, you know, as long as it wasn't egregiously unsustainable, mermaids, mermen, sharks, marlins, some tunas, flipper, like, basically otherwise though, I would take it. And we were working directly with 13 different fishermen and we just had products from all over the world and all over the country. Uh, but what it was, and we talked about this earlier in the class, what it was, was how it was packaged, which was, I, I was a noted chef. This was a hot spot in D.C. with a really great wine program and a beautiful dining room, and people trusted me. They knew that when they were coming in, they were going to get a good meal, and they knew it would be based on seasonal produce, and it would be small, adequate, delightful portions of the protein. But when you look at our menu of 18 to 23 entrees, you'd maybe heard of two of the fish. And it might be, like the example I used this morning was bearded brotula, which is, it's called bearded brotula. No, it's not going to sell itself. You know, or barramundi. It's like terrifying names that you would think Count Chocula would say in his advertisements, you know, on Saturday mornings. But like, what we sold was not bearded brotula. It was incredibly rich and delicious, sweet, aromatic fish with almost like a baked potato and nutty toasted butter-like aroma to it. The back end of it, almost this sort of hint of like violet or iris to it. And it's just wonderful. And the texture of it, this beautiful convex flake with a very small, delicate texture to it. Put it on your mouth. It has this slight elasticity and snappy bite to it, but then it just yields in this soft custard-like delight. Tonight we're serving it over a roasted leek risotto with some pine nuts and cilantro and thin shaved salad on top. Do you remember what fish I'm serving? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I sold you, you know, like I sold it to you a long time ago. People came in because they trusted it and because we put on a show. It was entertainment. That was the package. And they knew that what they were going to get was good. So it has to be through experiences like that that people say, oh, great, our dinner tonight at Madden Oyster Bar. It was like, periwinkles? What? These are edible? let alone incredibly delicious and kind of fun to eat. It's those experiences that begin to drive community interest. Instagram is really good for that. Uh, is your local stop and shop going to start carrying bearded brotula? Probably not. Um, the entire economy does need to shift where those products are worth money at the dock. Um, and a lot of that is going to have to come from government procurement uh, or large-scale institutional procurement. And it's going to come through somewhat anonymization of the fish. Like, I, I, I'm a, you always have to tell people what you're serving. You can't commit fraud. But there's a huge value in just calling it flaky white flesh fish, too. Because you know exactly what you're buying. You have to tell the truth. You have to create value for the bearded brotula but we can't be afraid to sell it through the category of the known. Sell the dish, not the fish, is kind of the way I put it. Um, I mean, I, I'm completely antithetical to fish fraud. You have to tell people what it is. But when a Sodexo or a University of Rhode Island Food Service or an Aramark or the military is putting together a menu, if there are regional availabilities of different species that fall under a useful category, that's what's really going to drive that procurement. And we're seeing this with Alaska Pollock, with some of the offcuts of Alaska Pollock, government procurement. Unfortunately, government procurement is all politics, um, which favors the big. But um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Uh, and I very much suggest you come back next week, because I, that's a lot of what's going to be addressed on a on a far more nuanced level than I can answer. Thanks. I have one, one last question. You've written eight books now, mm -hmm. correct? And um, out of those eight books, which one recipe 
would you recommend to all of us? Uh, with, with one, with not using the, uh, the top six seafoods. <laughs> there we go. Uh, slow roasted. So I do most of my fish cooking in a toaster oven. Uh, that was uh, $110. Breville toaster oven. Doesn't have to be Breville. I turn it on to about 300 degrees and I put basically whatever fish I'm cooking into it there. Butter or olive oil, depending on whatever else is going with it. And then you know what? I open a bottle of wine. And I relax a little bit because I'm not going to overcook the fish. Do you know how long it takes to overcook fish at 300 degrees? A long time. I actually have time to get the brown rice cooked. Not just the rice, the brown rice. Uh, I can cook some broccoli. I can ask my wife how her day was. I can actually take a little bit of the stress out of dinner because stress is the least delicious ingredient there is in cooking. Slow roasting. It doesn't work for muscly fish. Not Don't slow roast your tuna, your swordfish, your striped bass, or anything with a lot of tendon to it. But from any of the flaky white flesh fish, any of the local species like scup, like that, um, you're not going to get anything crispy out of your toaster oven at 300 degrees. Just be aware of that. But that is my favorite because anyone can do it using any, basically using the technology they've got. Um, yeah. So um, let's give Barton another warm round of applause. Thanks, y'all. Can I, can I mention one more thing? Yeah, you, I Sorry. Guess so. do, do you mind if I mention one more thing? If I could just do a little bit of sales work here. So one book that I don't have here tonight, I just have a couple copies, but I, I wanted to mention this because that idea of the social, the civic virtues, the social license, we don't hold it in our hearts or our national sort of dialogue, the, the role of seafood in the way that we hold the role of the farmer. Uh, you know, we all celebrate the heirloom tomato and the weird cauliflowers and all of the heritage breeds of pork and all that. But seafood was the first heirloom heritage food of this new nation, uh, indigenous peoples long before us, but it was upon the backs of cod and men and women that fished it that we took our first steps towards economic and political freedoms. Uh, the fish tail that is America cannot be overstated. Um, and I saw that there was lacking a history of that. Uh, and American seafood is my effort to codify that seafood matured so that we can decide that seafood matures to us still. It's a narrative culinary and anthropological study of every species landed in the U.S. Um, you know, it, it's an opinion book. I wrote it from my point of view, but it's a deep historical account. And I, I, I would ask, I, I bring it up just because it, to me, is a facilitator, a tool to help us create that social license, to, to decide why our coastlines matter, to decide and to really give the authority to our coastal stewards, to our fishermen, to our farmers, to, to understand why they matter to us. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. That, right. that was perfect. I was going to give everyone a reminder that to get your books, we do have um, books in the foyer that you can be purchased. Uh, we'll ask people to queue up uh, along the side, and we'll be signing up on the stage. Um, I want to remind you, next week we have this panel on the future of seafood, including Sarah Schumann and other great speakers. So I look forward to seeing you all, you, you all then, and thank you for coming. Good night. Thanks, y'all. Yeah.